Well, good morning, Central Amanda. It's so good to have you here. I welcome every one of you here. I welcome those of you who are on, the, uh, on any of our campuses. If you're watching this online or you're uh, uh, at home, uh, I'm traveling or wherever you are, uh, anywhere in the world, man, we welcome you as well. Um, we're going to jump right in today, all right? Um, I need you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. While you're doing that, I need to give you a really quick review of where we've been. We're in a series right now called Love Beyond, and the idea behind this series is that most of us understand that the thing that's supposed to set us apart is that we love one another. <clears throat> it was the one thing Jesus said, if you do this, it will, it will make it obvious that you actually follow me. Unfortunately, Christians are not known for loving one another, and certainly not known for loving people who are not like us, and that is a huge issue that we as a church are trying to address. So, we're in this, ser this series, and we're um, actually going through the book of Acts, and, and what I'm trying to show you in this series is that if we would actually do what God said, he would do what he did. And, but we want him to do what he did without doing what he said, and it's not going to work. So Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to pick this up. Now, the first week of this, this is week 3. Week 1 was just talking about the early church, and I explained that Acts is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. And then we talked about Jesus was, uh, he ascended, and he said he's going to come back. And so uh, the idea was, uh, man, have your mind on the future. Have an understanding that you, you love beyond the present moment. Don't get lost in this moment. There's more to come, and the most important stuff is, is coming. So live beyond, uh, love beyond the uh, present moment. And, but Jesus said uh, to his uh, disciples, he said, listen, I, when I leave you, I want you to stay in Jerusalem and you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might take the Holy Spirit for granted. They certainly did not. But he said, wait. And um, when it comes, it's going to give you power and it's going to give you power uh, to be my witness. You're going to be able to say things and do things in my name that are, uh, it's going to convince an unconvinced world that he's for real. All right. So that was kind of week one. Then last week, <clears throat> I showed you how they had waited in Jerusalem and then on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, um, the Spirit of God descended on them and they began to speak in foreign tongues. That was Acts chapter 2, the beginning of it. And there were all these people that had come to Jerusalem because it was a festival. It was, it was one of the, the holidays. Pentecost is like a big day. And uh, they were from all over the world and they heard the gospel in their own language and they were absolutely blown away. And they're going, how can this be? And some people said, it's a thing of God. And other people said, these guys are drunk. And the people are going, you don't speak legibly in foreign tongues when you're drunk. And so Peter got up and he said, listen, this is from God. And, and he lays it out. Now, here, here's what you got to remember about Peter. We, we left Peter in the book of Act, in the book of Luke, the, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four biographies of Jesus. Luke uh, is the prequel. Um, Acts is the sequel. He started here. The same author, okay? And, and uh, we left him in Luke, and, and Peter, was, Peter was like so overwhelmed at the crucifixion of Jesus, the capture and crucifixion, and, and he's like just distraught. And, and a little girl came up to him, and you'll remember this. He, 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 she said, you, you were one of his followers. And, and he said he wasn't, he denied. And then another girl, yeah, I did. and then he said it on an oath, I swear to God, I don't know that man. And then the rooster crowed, remember all this? And Peter ran out, he cried. He looked at Jesus, actually he turned in the courtyard, looked at Jesus and he began to cry because he knew what he had done. That was Peter in the prequel. The sequel, you got Peter kind of like, just, just again, dismayed at the crucifixion, at the, the price. But then, but then he's in the room and the spirit of God comes on him like Jesus said it would. And then if you remember what happened last week, he stood up and he's, he basically said, you crucified him. And you knew exactly who he was. And you knew exactly what you were doing. And he just laid it out. That was all last week. I don't have time to cover all that. At the end of that, they said, oh, my. Uh, what do we do? What do you do? After you know you crucified Jesus, what do you do? And Peter said, I'll tell you what you do. You repent and you get baptized. Repent means to change your direction, change your mind. Baptized is identifying with Jesus. We just, uh, we're, I'm on the Gilbert campus gang. We just witnessed a couple of people getting baptized it's when you say, I'm done, I want to be in him. I want to be identified in him. So 3,000 people said yes that day, and that was the men. Then there were women, and then there were children. They counted differently in that day. And what we're going to pick up right now is what happened next. 
You had all these new people going, I'm in Jesus. I want to be a Jesus. I want to be a Jesus follower. How in the world is this going to work? So Acts chapter 2, and we're, again, I'm going to go so fast today because I want to get to the end of the service. They may go, what? I want to get to the end of the service because we're going to do something really, really cool. And I want to make sure we have time. So you indulge me to go quick and, and you'll understand when we get there. Now, I want to say this. We're only going to look at six verses. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Those are six verses. Okay. These are some of the most important verses in the Bible. These are some of the most insightful verses. These are some of the most instructive verses. I think about these verses all the time. I've read these verses many times. I've read them to you many times. I literally meditate on these verses. This is the priorities of the church. This is what you're supposed to be doing, okay? So let me just, uh, let me read it, and then I'm going to go back and break it down so we can see it more carefully. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and, and, to, and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe of the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. <clears throat> you see, it started off with 3,000 men, more women, more children. It was a mega church from the get-go and then it just got bigger and bigger. Now, we're going to look closer at this because I want to show you there's only two parts to this. There's only two parts. Uh, the first verse is the first part, and this explains what they did. The second part is what happened because they did what they did. Of the, what they did, and then what happened because they did what they did. So let me show you the first verse, Acts 2.42. This is what they did, all right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's what they did. So this early church going, what do we do now? We're going to devote ourselves to these four things. Now, let me slow it down even further. I want to show you the first word. The first word in that is very important. It says they. Well, what, what is a they? Who is they? How do you get a they? You can never have a they by yourself. All right. A they implies more than one. They uh, were the new believers. They were the original apostles plus all these people that came to faith in Jesus. They are who we're talking about, all right? They, together. Um, and, and it just implies something. Now, what were they doing? What were they up to? And we'll find that in just a moment. Now, I want to read this passage again, uh, 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 but I want to show you something. Uh, I want you to listen very carefully to the words, these words. They themselves together, everyone, all in common, all of those take more than one person, all right? It, it was not about any single one of them. This is crucial to understanding how the early church literally grew to over, overthrow the Roman Empire. It was never about any one of them. It was about them, they, plural. We have a problem in America because we have been taught, it's part of our psyche, it's part of our zeitgeist as a country, that we are individuals. We are, we value individualism, independence. That's what we're all about. Don't tell me. And we have a hard time with group identity of anything. We, we want to be our own people because we, we value that so much. And the problem is we bring that into our understanding of God and it just absolutely does no place to put it. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. So um, we got to understand this. So let me, let me read this passage again. I'm going to go fast. But you see these words, and if you start to see these words, you can start to understand what they did and why what came out of this came out of this. They devoted, them, they devoted themselves. Nobody did it for them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You kind of get the idea that um, 
you can't do church alone. Now, you've all heard the expression, there's no I in team, but there's a lot of I's in church. And I don't mean what's on the front of your face. I mean a lot of individuals who literally come to church and it's all, it's all they're thinking about. And again, I, I'm, I'm not calling anyone out. I'm, I've done this, you've done this, we've all done this. We come to church and all what we're thinking is like, I don't really care about everybody else. I just want, you see, in our culture, we have, come, we have become convinced that not only is a relationship with God personal, but it's our, our right to privacy. It's personal and it's private, which means it's nobody else's business what's going on between me and God. Whatever God and I are up to, it's none of your concern. It's the way we think. So don't confront me on what I'm doing. Don't get in my face or my dish or my grill, whatever. Don't do that because it's none of your business. It's me and God and God and me, and that's all it is. It's just not godly. It's certainly not scriptural. Uh, it's not a solo sport, this thing we call Christianity, just so you know. It's kind of like this, and we don't understand this, but if you, uh, you might have a gas grill these days, but if you ever had a briquette, uh, you know, briquette barbecue, charcoal briquettes, remember the bag, and if you dump these little black things, they look like little pieces of coal, they're not, but they look like that, and you light them on fire, and when they're all glowing, then you know it's time to cook your, you know, whatever you're cooking. Here's the thing I've always said, look, that's awesome when they're all together, they burn forever, it seems, but you take one of those out and you set it aside, it's going to go cold. And so are you. But we don't get this. We don't, we don't believe this. I don't need everybody else. I'm perfectly fine with myself. Um, John, <coughs> excuse me, John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, he was a circuit-riding preacher in the 1800s. He said this, there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. Here's, my, here's what I got to challenge this church. We got lots of solitary Christians who see no problem with it and feel perfectly fine uh, being solitary. And we got to challenge that, all right? So the first thing you need to see is the word they. The second word you need to see is they devoted, devoted. We got to spend a word, uh, a moment on the word devoted. What does devoted mean? It means to be dedicated to, committed to, or invested in. They devoted themselves. It means that they express a value because that's what you devote yourself to, that which is valuable to you. Um, you never do. You never could say you're devoted to something that you never really participate much in. Like you could say, hey, and let me, let me just tell you all, I'm a, I'm a gym rat. You're supposed to laugh. It was supposed to be funny. <laughs> I'm a gym rat. You go, you can't be a gym. I am. I'm a gym rat. How often do you go to the gym? I, frequently. How frequently? Four times a year, maybe. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. You would never say somebody's devoted to something they do four times a year. I don't know if you know this, but um, the Cardinals are playing the Cowboys today. I don't know if you know that. And uh, I just am curious, how many, uh, how many Cardinals fans do we have in the crowd? There's about four of you. That's cool. How, how many Cowboys are here? Yeah, that's exactly what's going to be in the stadium. Trust me. But see, you, you can't say you're a devoted Cowboys fan or you're a devoted Cardinals fan. You can say it. You go, hey, I'm a Cardinals fan. Like, okay, that's cool, man. Uh, well, how often do you go to the games? Oh, I don't, uh, I don't get it very often. Well, how often? I don't know. When was the last time? I don't know. Kurt Warner threw this. <laughs> Devoted means you, you invest yourself in it. it. They, not one, they devoted themselves. Okay? Nobody can make you do this. And I, if you haven't heard me say this, I don't know how we've got in our head that some preacher can guilt you into doing something. And, and I, I say this all the time, man. I, this got to be voluntary, folks. You gotta, you gotta choose to do this yourself. I, I'm not ever up here trying to make you do something you don't wanna do. I don't think that's how God works. But you gotta come to a point where this is where your heart is. This is what matters to you. So uh, devotion implies habitual. We get it, yeah? So if we were to ask in our culture, what, what are people devoted to? Well, a lot of people say, well, I'm devoted to my, my spouse. And uh, again, these days, that's yeah, getting harder, but I'm devoted to my spouse. I'm devoted to my family, my kids. I'm devoted to my kids. So, uh, I'm devoted to my health. I'm devoted to my career. I mean, we can just keep going down the list. I'm devoted to working out. I'm devoted to my favorite sports team. I'm devoted to my kids' favorite sports team, the, the club team they play soccer on. Yeah, I'm devoted to that, man. Every Sunday we're gone somewhere. 
Here's what you got to wrestle with is in the list of all the things that you're devoted to, where does God fall in the list of devotion, of devotional items? Where, how much of a priority is God in your list of all the things that you would say I'm devoted to? And most of us would say we're devoted to more than one thing. How many are devoted to God? Well, here's all I need to show you is there's four things they said they themselves were devoted to. And it's not going to take me long to explain the four things. Number one, the apostles' teaching. So I'm back in Acts 2.42. It says the apostles' teaching. Uh, and by the way, the apostles' teaching means that all they had up to that point in time were the uh, Old Testament scriptures. And then people began to write down the things Jesus did. So the early church didn't have a Bible like this where they would go, hey, turn to the book of Luke. Uh, turn to the book of Acts, they were writing, they were living it, all right? So <clears throat> the apostles took the responsibility to teach the things that they had experienced in the presence of Jesus, that so that became written down and recorded, and we have it today. But in the early church, <coughs> excuse me, all these people are coming to faith, and they're going, what do we do? Uh, so the apostles would teach. Now, let me explain this. Teaching is making an impression, Teach, teaching is giving away something. It's giving away something. Um, the apostles' teaching is to give you instruction on things you've never heard of before. So, so when, when you come to church, you should hear things you've never heard before. But it's also to remind you of the things you've already been taught. I, I have forgotten so many things over the 50 years I've walked with Jesus. I need to be reminded. I also need to be course corrected. That's part of the apostles' teaching going, you're over here right now, Cal. You need to move back over here. Get back in the barbecue, man. You're doing this thing on your own. So there's an impression that the apostles' teaching would bring upon our lives. Uh, Paul, who's one of the apostles, told Timothy, who was one of the early uh, uh, biblical pastors and teachers, he, he said this, and I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 2.14, excuse me. Paul said, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Let me explain something. Paul was a tent maker. You, you, there, you would use goat skins to make tents in his day. There is no goat big enough to make a tent out of, so you'd have a pattern, and you'd take a goat and a goat skin and lay it over the pattern, and then you would cut it out according to the pattern, and then you get another part of the pattern and another part and another goat skin and another goat skin, and you cut all the pieces. When you can put all these pieces together and they fit, that's rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what he's saying. Be able to cut the word of God straight so that it all fits together. Not that this one pet thing that you love to talk about that doesn't fit in with the rest, but it's your favorite thing. He says, no, no, no. It's all got to come together. It's all got to fit together. And so remind the people, teach the people, warn the people. And by the way, here's a warning, church. Warn them about quarreling over words. We're coming to the most contentious election that we will have ever experienced up to this point in our life. Who knows what the future holds? Church, we were called to be above this. We were not called to get into the fray and start exchanging you know, snappy repartee with people who disagree with us. We were, we were to carry ourselves a certain way. Warn the people about the use of words. I'm warning from the word of God. We gotta be careful with what we say. Be careful what you post. Be careful who you argue with. It's not of God. I know it feels like it might be, but it's not. And, and, and so remind people is what he's saying. Now, every time we open the Bible, here's what you need to understand. Two-thirds of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. It's the Apostle's teaching. Hey, Peter. Peter was an apostle. Whenever we go, hey, turn to uh, first, uh, first Peter. James was an apostle. Yeah, I mean, I could just keep going here. John was an apostle. We could talk about Matthew. You get the idea? That's what we do. So the first part of being instructed in, in what the early church did is we, we opened the Bible and we're instructed in the scriptures. The second thing, they committed themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship is a word we don't use. Fellowship means community. It means hanging out. It means commit yourself to getting to know one another. Commit yourself to uh, being a part of something bigger than yourself. 
And uh, it actually gives us a clue, if I can read a little farther down, to actually what they did. It says in verses 46 to 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And a couple of things I want to point out there, uh, that they hung out. And where do they hang out? In their homes. And, and listen carefully, because I'm going I'm to have to explain this. In their church. Now, it says temple. Now, hang on. They hung out in their homes, uh, but the, when they met together in the temple courts, they didn't have church buildings. They didn't do this. This grew out of Judaism, out of the Jewish faith. So the synagogue and the temple, that was kind of big in their day, they would hang out where they had always hung out. So they would get together. And see, so many of us, we, we, we come to church and the goal is get in and get out as fast as you can get. Talk to no one. Make, you know, make no eye contact. And, and we're just, we're wondering, like, what, what, what's happening here? So they shared meals, had them over to their homes. You ever notice how, how special it is to eat a meal with somebody? Can, can I just point out something? Be, be conscious of this. See, see if I'm right. Uh, often when we sit down and we eat with somebody, we become extremely self-conscious. You, you know, you're kind of covering up your mouth. You're using your napkin really generously and making sure you don't chew with your mouth open. And you're, you're just hyper aware. It's hard to be yourself when you're hyper aware like that. When you're with good friends, you just enjoy. You just enjoy. You just enjoy eating and, and it's fun and you have a barbecue and have friends over and all this kind of cool stuff happens. There's something sacred that happens when we eat together where God just kind of shows up and he's like enjoying the meal. So that's what they did. They, they studied scripture. They hung out. They weren't in a hurry to get out. And the third thing it says, they broke bread together. What does that mean? Well, breaking bread is not uh, having, you know, lunch together. Breaking bread is where they would actually stop what they were doing and take a loaf and a, a cup of wine and they would remember. In fact, let me, show you the, let me show you in Luke what it says it happened, how it happened in the book of Luke when Jesus, the last time he was with his apostles, the last time, it was called the upper room, you've heard this, the last supper. I want, I want to show you this, okay? It, it says this, and I'm just going to read from Luke 22. Well, <clears throat> when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Now, I've got to stop right there because you're not going to understand what's happening. If you, talk about intimate, all right? Wh whenever you think of the Last Supper, my guess is you picture Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting of the Last Supper. You know the one I'm talking about where Jesus is standing there in long flowing hair, you know, and he's holding the cup and usually he's looking up to heaven, you know that? And then and you have all the apostles you know what I'm talking about, right? And um, well, that's the image we have. That was the last one. They're all on the same side of the table, and they're all looking at the camera. That's not what happened, folks. They were reclined at table. Why were they reclined at table? Because the table was that far off the floor. That's a Middle Eastern way to have a table. It's out. What do you mean they were reclined? It means you lay on your elbow on a pillow, and you stick your feet in the next guy's face. That's how you eat which is why washing feet became such a big deal, why it was so important, and why it was so relevant that nobody would wash the feet of each other. It's very intimate. So they would recline. So the Last Supper is around a table, all of them on their elbows, uh, all kind of pointing in the same direction as they go around the table so they can all fit, all right? And he said to them, Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you, the meal that they had shared, uh, before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. This will be my last time with you like this at this meal. Um, and then he said, uh, that after taking the cup, he, he gave thanks. So he took a cup that had wine in it. And he gave thanks. He said, this, take this, take this, this whole thing and divide it among you. Take this and share it among you. All right. So <clears throat> Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. What does that mean? It means he held up a loaf, said, God, thank you for this, and, and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Now, can I, can I point out a double entendre here? There's two meanings. This, this, this bread that I'm breaking represents what's gonna to happen to me. I'm gonna give myself to you. The, this 
bread, okay, look, look carefully at the words, um, he broke it and he gave it to them. This is my body given for you. You, you know what the church is called? The body of Christ. What are we? We're the body of Christ. This is my body. This is my body given for you. This is what God has done for you on your behalf through Jesus, through one another. This is for us. This is a gift that God has given us, all right? So do this, he said, in remembrance of me. This is very important you catch this. Don't just do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And uh, think about what is about to happen and don't let it slip away. Um, and the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Why do we take communion every single week? Because they gather together all the time. And when they did, they broke bread. So some churches tradition is do it once a month, once a quarter, twice a year, once a year. We do it every week, every service. We do this. I was in the last service. We did communion in the last service. We'll do it in this one too. And we'll do it in the next one because we believe the early church made a habit of it. But we do it in remembrance of him. The fourth thing is prayer. So there's four things. Apostles teaching, communion, or uh, 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 community, fellowship, communion, breaking of bread, and prayer. Now let me point out something. The apostles teaching is impression. You should be getting something that you don't know. You should be instructed in something. And then prayer is expression. It's what you're doing with what you were told. It's the idea of speaking to God instead of God just speaking to you. Church has happened when God has spoken to you and you've spoken to God. Too many times we come to church, we don't even speak to God or we let the guy up front speak for us. That's not how it works, all right? It's not how it works. Now, this is all under what, what they did. They did those four things. What did God do because they did what they did? Let me show you what God did with what they did. Let me read this very quickly. Just listen carefully. Uh, Acts 2.43 says, Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I don't know what you heard in all of that, but let me tell you what I heard. I heard Luke 9.23. That's what I heard. Luke 9.23 is the verse that we have chosen as a church years and years ago to say, this is going to be the cornerstone of what our fellowship is going to be about and if you know Luke 9, 23, it's when Jesus said, listen, if you want to be one of mine, and I hope that you know this by heart by now, we've said it so many times. If you want to be one of mine, let me paraphrase it. You can read it as it was. Like, he said, Jesus said, there's three things you got to understand. Number one, you got to get over yourself. It cannot be about you. If you think it's about you, you're out, you're out of bounds. Get over yourself. Deny yourself. Second thing is you take up your cross daily and you die to yourself. What does that mean? It, it, it means that you find your life in Jesus. You quit trying to live for yourself. It's not all about you anymore. In fact, it's not about you anymore. It's about him and you follow him. What does it mean to follow him? It means wherever he leads, you follow, you go. Wherever he points, he says, go there, you go there. It means he's your Lord, he's your boss, he's your ultimate authority. And uh, they, did, uh, they, they, they gave up their individualism and says, you know what, we're going to be a body together who obeys the commands of the head. Uh, that's Jesus. And uh, man, what happened? You know, a sense of God's power and awe prevailed. The church became selfless. God was glorified and lives were saved. In, in fact, this message is love beyond by being selfless. That, that, that whole idea. Let me, let me explain something here. Um, so often we come to church, please listen to my heart here, okay? I'm about to say something that's offensive, all right? I know this, but listen. So often we come to church, and we come to church with some expectation that the people at church are supposed to do something for you, whatever that is. So we come to church, and then we can often find ourselves walking out, and this expression can come out of our mouths. I didn't get anything out of that. I didn't get anything out of that as if the object of the worship were you. Listen carefully. As if somehow everything that was done here was to make an impression upon you. As if everything that was done here was to please you. 
as if you were the center of our focus as a church. Folks, it's not about you. I don't know how to say it. The question is never, what did you get out of it? And did you get anything out? It's never the thing we ask. We ask, did God get anything out of that? Did we do anything that God said, that, that was a blessing, that pleased me, that, that's what I was talking about. But see, when it's about us, we come here and we critique everything. We, you know, the preacher he preached too long today. I don't like that. Or we go, you know that song? I didn't like it. I, the volume's too high. I don't like that. And it's all about all these preferences. And the church would be better if they would just do everything I want them to do. But it's no longer about a community. Now it's about you. This is the serious problem we have to address. If it's about us, it's not about Jesus. It can't be about us. We have to be willing to let Jesus be God. Now, Here's the thing that I want you to understand. Um, we all live in a culture that has really screwed our brains over with the idea that we're incredibly important. Now, I'm not saying you're not important. I'm not saying that no, you're special. Okay, don't get offended. But I want to explain something to you. We are a very self-centered people as a culture. We are all into individual, uh, in, you know, individualization. So you go, to, you go to Starbucks and you can't just get a cup of coffee. No, no, no. It's got to be da, 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 five pumps of that. We can't just get a cup of coffee. And, and, and we, we insist on, and I, I'm sending this back because it's not exactly, okay, let me, let me explain something, okay? Um, we, we somehow in this incredibly self-centered culture are supposed to learn how to be selfless. It's really, really hard. Because everything about us just promotes self-centeredness. And, and so, now I'm gonna, I want to ask you a question. How many of you know a selfish person? Raise your hand. Oh, don't, you, oh come on. You, they're on your mind right now. You know exactly. Everybody knows. Every, can I get an amen? Does everybody know a self-centered person? Okay, okay I'm going to ask you a simple question. Who's your favorite self-centered person? <laughs> of all the self-centered people you know, who's your favorite? <laughs> you, I don't have one. Why not? I don't like any of them. I don't like any selfish person. But can I point something out to you? You're, you're not telling the truth right now because there is a very selfish person that you quite adore. There's a very selfish person that every time you see their selfishness, you justify it and you explain it and rationalize it and you defend it. And you, who's that selfish person? You. You see, I am my favorite selfish person and you are yours. And, and so when I'm selfish, I can justify why I'm self-centered. When you're selfish, you're just selfish. What's wrong with you? But we live in a culture. I've said this before, you know, parents, there's nothing wrong with this. Don't hear this bad. Parents, what is the first word you want your kid to say? Your name. Mama. Dada. And it's a contest. Can I get an amen from parents? A lot is writing on this. And uh, I don't know who won the contest, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying... But isn't it funny? I want you to say me, me, say me, me. I'm more important than them. me, mama, dada. What is the kids, you, if that's their first words or mama or dada, let's give them that. What's their next word? Mine. Mine. <laughs> mine. It's not just mine. No, no, it's, there's an action that goes with this. And I've done this before. I'll do it again. Whenever a kid is going to say the word mine, they're communicating a ton about their worldview. All of this right here, whatever I'm calling mine, I'm communicating, not yours, okay? Keep your hands off. This here belongs to me. But they don't just say it. They, they don't say, it. they never say it politely. Like, you know, it'd be incredibly kind of you if you would have just acknowledged that this is actually my property and not yours. That would give me a peace of mind that you understand that this is entitled to me, not to you. They never say that. No, you know what they do? They grab something, whatever the something is, and then they wrap their hands around it, and then they pull it to their chest, and then they turn away from you, and then with the most demonic voice you've ever heard, mine! And that's your little angel. <laughs> that's usually your little spawn that you're supposed to raise up and teach. That's not godly. And that's a very hard thing to do. Now, we're going to close this message. I'm going to give us four applications we're going to walk away from here with. All right? Four applications. And um, we're going to take this and we're going to go, okay, if this is how the early church 
function, maybe we should think about how we function and are we online. So uh, we want to do a couple things. Number one, and I told you I'm, we're going to have fun with this, we're going to take communion together, all right? Now, I want to I want to point out something. Communion is called the Eucharist. Eucharist means gratitude. It's the idea of giving thanks. Giving thanks. So let, me, let me read to you from 1 Corinthians. When Paul was leading the body in remembering what Jesus did, this is how he said it. Listen carefully. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, we already read this. This was from Luke. It was from all the Gospels, but I read it from Luke. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this uh, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until, it comes, until he comes. Now, here, here's, here's what we do, okay? This is uh, American individualism at its best taking communion. So, okay, um, I'm going to tune everything and everybody out. I'm going to try my hardest to think about me and God, me and God. And so I don't want any noise of y'all are breathing too loudly behind me. Could you stop doing that? Because you're messing up my concentration because this is a minute between me and God. And the band, I need you to quit playing under that. That's just really distracting to me. And and when you sing those songs, I get so upset because I'm, it's just me and God, okay? Get, get, uh, get it together and stop interrupting me and God. You see, we've individualized this. Jesus didn't do that. He took bread, and it doesn't say anything about, hey, everyone, close your eyes now. Close your eyes. He never said anything like that. He held it up, and he says he broke it, and he said, this is my body. So church, would, would you do something? It's, just, it's gonna be awkward, it's gonna be fun. You don't get to close your eyes. You don't get to tune all the rest of us out. This is my body. So would you take the bread and give thanks for what Jesus did, but also for the fact that you're not sitting in a room that's empty, wherever you are. You might be sitting in a room that's empty, you need it. Um, but the idea is, God, I thank you that I'm a part of something bigger than me. There's more to life than me. I'm a part of your body. So God, I just give you thanks right now. I give you thanks for what you did for me on the cross, and I give you thanks for my brothers and sisters who share the faith that I share. So let's do that. In the same manner, it says that he, uh, he held the cup, and we, the fruit of the vine, we use grape juice, they used wine. This represents the blood. It's not the blood, it represents the blood that was shed on the cross so that you could be free from sin. You could be forgiven. Not just you, the person next to you. Everyone in your row, everyone in the building has access to the forgiveness of God. Thank you, God. Eyes wide open for what you did for me and what you did for them, what you did for us. That's the first thing. I want to show you something that came out of this. Because it, it's not just those four things. I want to show you the next thing. Um, let me just keep reading. Acts 2.44 says this. <clears throat> All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Wait, what? Yeah. What they did... When you have your eyes wide open, you start looking around and you start seeing they need help. They need help. They need help. They need help. They started putting other people ahead of themselves. Here's, here's the deal. A church has a tradition of receiving an offering. Let me just explain a couple of things quickly. The only resource a church that's doing it the way I think God wanted it to be done is not hoarding money, is the people come together and then they entrust the leadership of a church to disperse funds that they've uh, sacrificed. And the church leadership then has to figure out how do we distribute this? And this goes all the way back to uh, Acts chapter six and just the idea of how do we do church? So what happens is, is that we give because we have a need. So we, uh, 
we collect an offering. And again, we don't ever make a big deal about this in the shirt. We don't pass anything down the plate. You ever notice this? We don't do anything that makes you feel like uh, you have to twist your arm to get you to do it. Don't do things that someone has to twist your arm to get you to do. That's not of God. But when you have the heart of God, you start realizing it's bigger than you. And that here, I just, can I make a confession? Can I be honest with you? I can spend all my money on me. I am capable of that. Can I get an amen from anyone who is greedy as I am? There's not a soul here. Amen. Thank you, that one honest person. You, you, you'll be with me today in paradise. That's a joke. Here's the deal, folks. We're all this way. And the problem is, is a lot of us do spend all of our money on ourselves. That's the problem. We don't put anyone else ahead of ourselves. That is not how we live in a body of Christ. That is not appropriate behavior for believers. So what I do, what my wife and I do, is we set apart, at the, we literally, we come into a new year, we, uh, this is what we're going to make, this is what we're going to give in a formal way, and it, it, it's more than a tenth of our income, just so you know, I'm not going to tell you what it is, more than a tenth. And I don't ever see that. It's all through the bank. It's all removed. I don't, uh, that's not the extent of it, though. It's whenever we see things, we see somebody needs help. Somebody, can I give to this? Can I give to that? There's a, there's a discipline to giving, and then there's a spontaneity to giving. Here's what you need to understand. Giving is part of the Christian experience because it puts others in front of yourself. And God wants you to grow and to become the kind of person that will do that and not be forced to do that. So they gave to people who had need. They went out and sold stuff. Do you see that? They went out and sold stuff. They got stuff and they sold stuff. It got me to thinking, how much stuff do we have? How much stuff do you have that you have no real use for? You could sell that stuff. You could have a garage sale and give that away. You could give the thing away. You could sell the thing. You could... How many clothes are in your closet that are perfectly good clothes? You never wear them. Those shoes, you never wear those shoes. So I got to thinking about this. So I went to uh, a ministry in our church. Uh, we have, it's called the Axe Ministry. We, we just take care of homeless people. I don't know if you know we do that. But the limit is always the resource. How much do we have that we can give? It all depends on how much our people give. But that's all we got. So we have these collection uh, bins around the campuses. It'll say Axe. What does that go? It goes to the homeless. That's what it does. But we went to them and we said, look, and this is interesting. Don't, don't miss this. This, is in, I, this was intriguing. We said, what is, it that, um, what is it that you need most of? And, they, and I'm, I'm going to say this. I can't believe I'm actually going to say this in church, but I'm going to say what they said. You know what they said? We need underwear, bras, and socks. I can't believe I just said that in church, but I just did. We need bras, underwear, and socks. And, uh, and, and they said, look, here's the problem when you're working with the homeless. It's really easy to look down and lose dignity for the homeless. They're, they're going to be grateful to get anything. Give them your worst. And they said, you know, it's really uh, uh, discouraging to give somebody used uh, intimate apparel. I'll say it that way. I go, yeah, I guess it would be. I never really thought about that. So I said, how could we help you? And they basically said, hey, if you want to help, they said three things. Bring these three things new. So I've already been on, uh, I've already ordered this stuff on Amazon. Not, not, not the middle one, just so we're clear. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's coming to my house, not the middle one. That's my wife. She's in New York. She'll take care of that when she gets back. Anyway, um, but I also said, is there other stuff? And they said, yeah, gently used stuff, meaning not beat up, not things that nobody else would want. And they suggested these things. Men's shoes, uh, apparently si these sizes. I, I don't know. These are what they said. Jackets, blankets, sleeping bags, duffel bags, bikes. And then they said, you know what the problem is? We give out bikes. We give out bikes. And they're so grateful to get a bike because they have some transportation. But then it gets stolen. They said, they don't have a bike lock. Hmm. Okay. So I just had this idea. What if we just, above and beyond what we normally do, next week, next week, we come to church and we bring some stuff. And you don't do it if you don't want to, but you'll never do it if you don't know there's a need. So, hey, there's a need. Can we do something about this? And I think, folks, we can do something about this. So next week, we'll collect that. All right? Okay, here's the third one. 
I got I got I got a hustle. Here's the third one. Uh, it says this. Uh, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can I explain what they were? Please, please, please. They were a light in darkness. They were a light in darkness. And Jesus said, let your light shine in such a way that people see your good deeds and glorify. Not you, no, but your Father in heaven. So I know you've noticed this, but out, on the, uh, out in the lobby here and in the lobby and the campus you're on, we have a light board um, and, and what we've done is we've asked you, and I'm going to keep doing this every week, just again, just so you know, uh, write your name on a bulb and write uh, the name of somebody that you will commit to be a light. I, God, not to me, now, don't, make a commitment, don't make a commitment to central, make a commitment to God. God, I will promise before your, your honor, I will, to the best of my ability, I will do my best to represent who you are. I will shine in their life. I will pray for them regularly. I will serve them every time I can. I will invite them. I will remember them. I will, God, just trust me on this one. I will do my best. Now, listen, it's not your job to bring them to Jesus. That's God's job. That's the Spirit's job. You don't need to go point out all the sin in their life. That's not your job. Your job is to love beyond. When we did this two weeks ago, there's only been two weeks. By the way, that board is like crazy lit, if you've seen it. But, um, a dear lady in our church, uh, who's a, a friend, who's a dentist, she, I was talking to her last week, and she said, can I show you something? And she said, can I show you what my son did? This is Clint. This is a four-year-old. He went to his mom, and he said, Mom, I got a friend that doesn't know Jesus. Can I put his name on a bulb? A four-year-old cares about his friends. Do you care about your friends? Do you care about people you know? Um, as soon as we're done, uh, all campuses, just go out there if you haven't done it yet. You know, I already did it once. Do you only have one friend? There's only one person you know that doesn't know Jesus? You can take a whole row. We're, I'm giving you permission. You can have an entire row of people you're praying for. Just write their name and make a commitment before God and be that light. All right? All right, now... Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. We're going to close out this service, and um, it's going to be really cool. Let me tell you how we're going to close this service. So the early church gathered together, and they, they would hear the teaching of the Word of God. We've done that. And they would break bread together, and we've done that. And they would fellowship. They would hang out. We've done that maybe, to whatever degree. But we're going to make sure that um, we don't uh, fail to do the fourth thing, and that is that we're, we want to make sure we pray. Um, now, here's the deal. Uh, when you come to church and somebody prays uh, up front, it's not really your prayer. It, it, you know, you can say, I prayed, but um, I don't think that's what they did. I think what they did is they were in a community and they met people and they told people, hey, if you get a moment, would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? Uh, we're going to close the service by I'm, I'm turning it over to y'all. In, in just a moment, I'm going to walk off of here and the service is over. You got the closing prayer this week. You go, oh, no, preacher, that's on you. I do it every other week. It's your turn. It's your turn. What are you talking about? No, I was just saying the people that are right around you who always sit there anyway, you ought to get to know them. And just kind of, well, four or five, six of you just form a service. You don't have a lot of time. There's another service coming in here. Okay, so it's not a huge assignment. You go, well, well I, don't, I don't know how to pray out loud. I'm not asking you. If you don't want to pray out loud, don't pray out loud. But pray. But I know one of you is an extrovert in that circle. One of you is the most extroverted in that circle. I'm just going to ask you to just lead. And, and, and if there's time, for all, all to pray, that's awesome. If everyone's willing, I don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, don't come to church to have somebody else do all your spiritual stuff. It's not what church is. It's from your heart. It's your part of the body. So, um, hey, I mean, you go, oh, pray, pray for somebody's name on their light. That'd be an idea. Anyway, um, so it's been great to be with you. Um, closing prayer. We'll see you next week. Bye now.